Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Trevor Burrus. And I'm Aaron Powell. Joining us today is William J. Watkins, Jr., research fellow at Independent Institute in California and former prosecutor and defense attorney who has practiced in various state and federal courts. He is the author of Crossroads for Liberty, Recovering the Anti-Federalist Values of America's First Constitution. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Bill. Guys, thank you for having me. Great to be here. The subtitle of your book says America's First Constitution. I assume you're referring to the Articles of Confederation? That would be a great assumption. A lot of Americans and scholars and others just really don't understand that we had a national constitution, if you will, a confederal one before the Constitution of 1787. And this book is designed to renew interest in those first charters of American liberty. We're all, I mean, a lot of people, if you remember, I guess, seventh grade government, maybe sixth grade. American maybe, history. American history. You, you probably remember the Articles of Confederation enough to answer like a Jeopardy trivia question of what came before the Constitution. They were the failure we had before the Constitution. But that's also what you learn. It's the, the failure. Um, why do you, do you, well, I guess, were they a failure is the first question. People are taught that they're a failure. I disagree with that. And that's one of the big topics of the book. You know, if we look at the articles, there were two uh, goals that uh, the framers of the articles had. One was defeat of Great Britain in the Revolutionary War, and two was preservation of self-government in the individual states. If you look at the outcome of that conflict and where we were in the mid to early 1780s, the Articles achieved both. We defeated a superpower, the greatest military power in the world at that time. We were able to defeat that regime under the Articles of Confederation. And just as important, we were able to preserve self-government in the states where the people could govern themselves in their state and local assemblies without being under the thumb of Westminster. What does confederation mean in Articles of Confederation? A confederal system, uh, unlike a national system, is essentially an agreement, a partnership among sovereign entities, co-equal entities, where they retain their full sovereignty, yet they agree to work together in partnership for certain agreed-upon ends, whether it be trade, national defense, etc. It would depend on the scope of the agreement. So would this be like a multilateral treaty? You know, uh, that's not a bad way to describe it. Perhaps it goes in depth a little bit more than what we typically think of as a treaty of friendship or a treaty of amity. But, uh, you know, that that's a fair description. What about, so, but it seems more than the UN is what I was thinking, where there's a little bit more togetherness than the UN. Maybe it's more like Switzerland. I'm not, I don't know that much about the Swiss governing system, but something like a treaty, but but would it be right to think that all the 13 colonies under the Articles of Confederation were like separate countries? No, they definitely were separate countries. Uh, you know, some of the colonies, for example, Virginia felt very strongly that once we concluded the peace with Great Britain, that it as an individual state had to individually ratify that since it was a sovereign state for it to be binding. The Confederation Congress and the emissaries uh, for the Congress, that was not sufficient. They recognized themselves to be a sovereign and independent state. And again, I think the Treaty of Paris is really telling. Uh, if you read the Treaty of Paris, which few people do, they might have an awareness of it, but it indicates that King George uh, is settling matters and is declaring a state of peace to exist uh, between his realm, and then he specifically enumerates the 13 sovereign independent states of the United States of America. So what else did the Articles of Confederation do? They, they, did they empower the government much at all? We always hear this sort of, they couldn't uh, raise armies or have taxes. Taxes is usually the one that is often cited. And, and there was a Congress, correct, but, but there wasn't a president or a judiciary. So, so what extra powers did they give the 13 colonies acting together? 
Well, under the Confederation, Congress really did have a lot of authority. It had a lot of power. I know our modern Hamiltonians uh, would disagree with me on that, but it certainly had enough power that it could fight a war. It certainly had enough power to raise troops. Did it have trouble paying those troops? Sure it did. But in a situation that we were in, uh, fighting a superpower, being essentially a backwater uh, wannabe republic or a group of republics, um, Congress did an excellent job in handling foreign policy and handling the war effort. Were there bumps in the road? Absolutely, there were bumps in the road. But it had plenty of power and order uh, to do its business and to see that we were able to defeat Great Britain. But so a government in war and the powers that a government fighting in war needs are different than those of a government in peace. Um, so did it have – what kind of powers did it have as a government, um, as a Congress in peacetime? Was it a government that could have functioned for a lengthy period of time in peace or was it really only focused on winning this particular war? No, it did function in peace. It was functioning until the constitution the U.S. Constitution went into effect after the Philadelphia Convention. It also had restrictions upon the states uh, where the states agreed, for example, uh, not to enter into uh, certain treaties, not to lay certain uh, duties or imposts that, affeared, uh, that interfered with Congress, uh, restrictions on vessels of war and many other things like that. Uh, Congress could certainly spend money. Congress could act for the exigencies of the union. Now, on some of these powers, there was a super majority requirement uh, to ensure that Congress did not abuse its power. Uh, but Congress had plenty of powers that we would typically think that a confederal or a federal or um, even a national government has to conduct business, to conduct international affairs, uh, and to govern itself. So it's uh, – let's say it's 18, 1786 or 85, uh, around that time. And uh, – there's a discussion emerging that there might need to be some changes done to the Articles of Confederation. One of those changes, one of the problems that had been seen was this unanimity requirement when it comes to raising certain amendments. And the, what had happened twice was that Rhode Island had been the only state to vote down the ability of the government to raise money via tariffs. And some of these things helped precipitate the Constitutional Convention. At that time, if you were around at that time, would you have been in favor of amending the articles uh, along the lines that some people were discussing and increasing some of the powers of the confederated government? I absolutely would have. And I think most of the anti-federalist writers who oppose ratification of the Constitution would agree that there were problems in the articles. Probably the biggest problem, as you pointed out, is Congress did not have an independent source of revenue to pay off our Revolutionary War debts or even to really keep the government going. Uh, after the war, many expected that we would be this great, prosperous country. They failed to take into account that when we lose protection of the Royal Navy, we lose trading status with Great Britain, we no longer have access to certain lucrative trading spots such as the British West Indies, and we went into an economic depression for a while. Uh, I think it would have helped Congress to have some limited source of revenue, even if only for a period of years, uh, so it could manage and pay the debts. Um, there were problems getting all the states to meet the requisitions of Congress. Of course, we were under a requisition system then. Congress requested that the states provide money or material. And again, coming off a war, uh, it was hard for all of the states to come up with what was requested. Even during the war, uh, there were troubles, but that was to be expected. So long story short, in the answer to your question, I would have been in favor of some, at least a limited measure that would have allowed Congress to have its own revenue. And that really was the big sticking point that caused the Philadelphia Convention. And so if you were called to – so the first convention is the 
1786 Annapolis Convention where they were trying to amend the articles and not enough people showed up and and then they said, okay, we'll do it again in, in Philadelphia in May of 1787. Um, you, would you have gone, if you were elected to that, gone to that convention going and hoping to modify parts of it as you said but then someone like James Madison came in thinking bigger thoughts. What, what was James Madison thinking? Madison, unfortunately, came in with a very detailed plan, his uh, Virginia plan, where he wanted so far as to give the national government a negative over state legislation, a national veto there, uh, very broad powers to the national government rather than the specific enumerated powers that the convention ended up with. Madison, like others, uh, felt some frustration with some of the difficulties in the articles, and unfortunately, he gave up on that system. Lance Banning, in his book, The Sacred Fire of Liberty, posits, and I think correctly, that perhaps had Madison foreseen how some of the new and invigorated powers of the Constitution of, of 1787 would ultimately be abused, uh, he might have been a non-signer to that document that he was so instrumental in crafting, as well as perhaps, as his friend Jefferson did, look back on some fondness of the checks that the articles had on government. Why were the states – I mean so they – you said that under the Articles of Confederation, the states maintained sovereignty um, and, and that seems to have been something that was pretty important to them. They thought of themselves as – you know, as their own entities first, and then members of this this larger group second. Um, what changed? Why, when Madison showed up with his detailed plan, were so many of them willing to give up what had seemed like a pretty central piece of their identity? Well, you've got to remember too, Madison in selling the Constitution along with the other Federalists to the states and to the people pointed out in the Federalist Papers and in other speeches and documents that the states would still be sovereign entities with respect to those items not given over to the general government. And he specifically enumerated trade, war, peace, uh, and a few other matters. Essentially, we would be one as to external matters relating to foreign affairs, war and peace. Uh, as to uh, commerce among the states, we would have a great free trade area that the national government would ensure uh, that customs booths didn't go up, for example, between North and South Carolina, but rather that goods could move freely. So there was a promise to the people and the states that they would indeed be sovereign, that they would be as sovereign as France or Great Britain over their own internal concerns. But the federal government, the national government would be sovereign over those national or uh, foreign concerns. And that was the promise. That was the understanding. Now, has it worked out that way? I would say absolutely not. And many anti-federalists writing at the time uh, scoffed at Madison's idea that you could split the atom of sovereignty, that the national government could be sovereign as to some matters and the states as to others. They scoffed at that said it was a solecism in politics. Uh, of course, you know, looking back on that, it seems like they had perhaps a pretty good argument uh, when we see the states now as what, merely administrative subdivisions of the national government. Was the convention, the constitutional convention, was it just full of, of nationalists, so to speak? Was it just full of, of people who wanted to greatly expand the powers of the articles will actually not just expand them because they sort of ditched them within the first week and said we're not even going to amend them anymore. So it seems like the convention was just full of a particularly uh, nationalist type of attitude. There was a strong contingent of nationalists. Of course, there you had your George Masons, your Roger Shermans and others uh, that would advocate for the smaller states, for retaining uh, – more of a confederal type system, not going so far uh, as Madison uh, and some of the others would. The New York delegation 
uh, other than Hamilton, of course, who left after a spell, uh, was a strong sort of anti-federal contingent. But unfortunately, Madison had things so well planned out, had his Virginia plan ready to go, when by the time that uh, the New Jersey plan or the Patterson plan, however you want to describe it, could be drawn up and offered as a counter Um, The Virginia plan was the plan of discussion, and that framed the whole debate, despite the fact that the charge of the convention was to consider amending and revising the articles, not creating an entire new system of government. There are a lot of, um, I think the right word, I don't think conspiracy theories, but uh, theories of planning and grandiose theories of action behind the Constitutional Convention, the most famous probably being Charles Beard's thesis that it was a bunch of rich people trying to make themselves richer to make that very simplified. But And the libertarians are kind of prone to describing the Constitutional Convention as a coup, a particular type of constitutional libertarian who liked the Articles of Confederation a lot. Is that an accurate characterization or is that a little bit overblown? Should, should we be calling it a coup or should we recognize that, that they were trying to do some work to fix something that, that didn't work at the time? No, I think it's more complicated than trying to consider this convention as either a coup or a completely good faith effort at um, modifying the scheme of government. Undoubtedly, there were those in the convention that would have stopped at nothing, actually weren't very happy truly with the final product because they thought too much power was left with the states. Uh, You know, you have that. And then I think also you have, as we march forward into the 1790s, when we see how the Constitution is actually implemented and used, I think Madison and some others uh, were truly aghast that provisions were being interpreted in a very nationalistic and Hamiltonian way uh, when that was not the bill of goods sold to the people. And Hamilton and others had specifically advocated uh, in a different manner during the debate. So were there a handful of folks who perhaps acted in bad faith and were simply trying to stage a coup for national power. I think there were. Were there also a number of good and solid men who were simply trying to do the right thing and invigorate the national government as needed, uh, but not destroy the states and sort of the idea of a federal system of government? Uh, There were. I think it's a complicated story. We can't just uh, pigeonhole what happened in one category or another. Are we overselling what happened to the Constitution when we say something like, you know, like again, constitutional conservatives and libertarians are prone to saying things like, you know, very quickly the Constitution proved to be what the anti-federalists say it, w- it was going to be, or it proved to be a, a system of national power that was that it immediately broke the bounds that they had tried to put on it in the convention, because we d- we don't have much of a federal government until the 20th century, comparatively speaking. At the very least, it, it, took, it took 110 years if we just said until 1900 for them to start expanding into food and drug regulation and things like this. And then, of course, the New Deal uh, was was another big uh, moment when the, when the government expanded drastically. So if they did for 140 years, if we say from 1790 to 1930, if it did a pretty good job of keeping things under under – I guess the federal government under some sort of control is isn't that kind of a success and and something we should uh, acknowledge and say yes it did work for a while. Sure, compared to what we have today, it was definitely a success. But I think we would be dishonest if we didn't note that again at the very beginning with Hamilton's financial plan, with the national bank, with the neutrality proclamation, as we see the president. Uh, rather than the Congress taking a strong hand in foreign affairs. Then we see in the late 1790s under the Adams administration with the Alien and Sedition Acts, where despite a clear First Amendment, despite the ratification debates being in everyone's recent memory, uh, the national government makes criticism 
uh, of its officers and its doings a crime where you could go to jail, um, be fined $2,000, and many newspaper editors and others were indeed imprisoned. Uh, we see Madison join the ranks of Jefferson and in the opposition, trying to halt this expansive interpretation, trying to keep the genie of implied powers in the bottle, or at least not growing to the extent that it would. We had problems early on. The Anti-Federalists were correct uh, that the Constitution's powers were susceptible of abuse, and they pointed these things out. However, even with this abuse, we don't see anything on the scale of what we have today till perhaps, you know, you could say um, with the Civil War, war between the states, whichever you prefer there, uh, with the Lincoln presidency, you see a sort of a glimpse uh, of what could happen, where these powers could take the national government. Uh, then things quiet down for a while. Um, of course, we have World War One and the you know, Mr. Wilson's war socialism that gives another good glimpse uh, where we're headed there and what the powers of the Constitution and certain inter interpretations are susceptible of. So yes, uh, would we be feel like we were much freer uh, even under Woodrow Wilson's Constitution? Yes, we would, but that's still a far cry from what the Anti-Federalists and even Madison and his advocacy early on uh, would have preferred. So do you think that had – at that convention, had they actually – had they stuck to the the initial stated goals of revising and amending the Articles of Confederation instead of proposing and then adopting this new constitution, that we would be freer today, that the country would be more effective and better from a libertarian perspective than it is now? No, I think we absolutely would be. You know, when Jefferson first saw uh, the draft of the uh, Philadelphia Convention, the plan, uh, you know, he wrote back to his friend Madison that he was very disappointed uh, from what he saw that we had abandoned the confederal system, that the articles sh should have been kept, he said, and almost like a, a great relic and venerated and still used. He thought, in his words, three or four amendments to the articles uh, would have sufficed and cleaned up some of the problems that we uh, had as a country. Uh, I think some strong structural constitutional change rather than a unicameral structure. I think our bicameralism was a big improvement in the Constitution. I think having a, a separate executive department uh, as well as a judiciary was an improvement when we consider separation of powers there. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think if we look at Jefferson's draft of a constitution for the state of Virginia, uh, we see several provisions, you know, such as I've just mentioned, that could have been incorporated and uh, essentially saved what was a sound structure, though with some problems. And we would not have seen so quickly and what we have today with just a host of officials, federal officials, uh, micromanaging really every aspect of lives or the state's business. When we are looking back at that time period or when we're judging the Articles of Confederation versus the Constitution and the, the scope of – U.S. history since, um, and especially when we're kind of critiquing it, saying, you know, what, when were we, would we have been freer? Um, when were we freer than we are now? The the elephant in the room is always slavery. Um, how would it, the Articles or something that didn't look like the Constitution, the federal government that it it created, have dealt with the slavery problem? Do you think we would have had slavery longer if we hadn't adopted the Constitution? You know, I think eventually, and I, I can't give you a precise time period, but whether we have a constitution or a confederation, uh, slavery would have eventually died out on its own. If you look at the history of slavery in the modern world, the only two countries in this hemisphere uh, to have resorted to violence to end slavery uh, would be modern-day Haiti 
and the United States of America. Uh, in Brazil, uh, many other places where the institution existed, uh, there was a um, peaceful emancipation there. Why do we have to be an exception to the rule? I don't believe it's some sort of original sin, as the Straussians uh, would have us believe there. Uh, as libertarians, do we believe that each individual is created equal and have certain rights that ought to be guaranteed? Absolutely, we find the institution anathema. But I think we can look at world history, especially of that time, and see that it was dying out or did die out on its own without violence in most places. And there's no reason we should have seen ourselves as an exception. Well, there's also an argument which I find pretty fascinating that uh, the Constitution helped perpetuate slavery longer than it, it should have gone, partially because of the the voting power that was given to the South due to the three-fifths compromise that there were just – if you're having representation for enslaved African Americans, that meant that the South had more representatives in Congress than they would have had otherwise, which meant that up until Jackson – the only northern president uh, is John Adams uh, for m most of the first seven presidents and that created – I would say a constituency, a, a stronger slave power constituency in the Congress than it would have otherwise had. Of course, on the flip side, you do just you would have slave states just continuing to be able to operate as slave states, and the question of whether or not it petered out. No, I think you know the northern states certainly, though they entered into the agreement with eyes open, um, they had good gripes of disproportionate southern power because of that compromise, the three-fifths clause. Um, it's a good argument that slavery was perpetuated by that, and just that extra political power, sure, that would rankle uh, other states and perpetuate uh, tension among them, whereas in a confederal system, you likely wouldn't have that. There's another interesting a uh, problem that comes up with the Articles of Confederation. And a while back, I did a Free Thoughts episode. Aaron was not uh, part of the episode. It was with Gary Gerstel, who uh, wrote a book called Liberty and Coercion. And in that episode, his, his main argument is that libertarians, he doesn't mean libertarian specifically, but uh, freedom-oriented people who cite the Constitution uh, as a freedom document are often ignoring how unfree the states could be not and not just with the obvious unfreedom of slavery, but states were incredibly coercive in their ability to control what substances you could put in your body, who you could marry, what your sexual practices were, a ton of other things. Also, they were uh, devaluing their currency. Possibly, they were privileging creditors over debtors. They were they were basically have mere like a. Occasionally, and this is in Madison's view too, they would just go nuts that the states would be dominated by some faction which would create a very unfree world and, and liberty of having secure debt, for example, would be, would be compromised. So are we really putting our eggs in the right basket of freedom if we said that oh, this would have been much better for the states to have more uh, sovereign power over their own citizens uh, without control of the federal government because the states could definitely have become despotisms in their own right? They certainly could have, but the big difference is would you rather have a system where you roll the dice for 50 states with a national one-size-fits-all remedy? Or would you rather have a system where, sure, uh, states can enact very bad policies, make poor decisions, but you have the state serving as laboratories of democracy where different things can be tried if they're found to fail? Well, that's a good example to other states not to try that particular policy or program, whether it be uh, devaluing the currency or whatever. People can vote with their feet. If, for example, let's look at uh, a modern issue like health care. If we didn't have Obamacare, if the states had been allowed to experiment as, say, Massachusetts, Tennessee did with TenCare, um, where they created their own mini versions of Ob Obamacare, if you will, well, absent the national government getting involved, if that 
was slowing the economy of those states or the health care deteriorated in those states, people had the option to vote with their feet uh, rather than move to a different country like Canada or Mexico or somewhere in South America, a citizen of Tennessee that was unhappy with what was going on in Tennessee could cross the Blue Ridge Mountains and be in North or South Carolina, a very similar culture, climate to what they were used to, uh, where such programs uh, weren't going on. They could vote with their feet on also a smaller scale with state government. Uh, you know your representatives more likely than not versus your national representative. You know, try getting close to a national senator or even a representative. You know, the average representative represents about 700,000 people in the typical district, whereas in the states, you're much more likely, say, perhaps to go to church with your representative, uh, see him around town. These representatives in the states typically still have jobs. You might be interacting with those representatives. In other words, the people can uh, inveigh against particular programs, hold these representatives accountable more so than at the national level. And as I said before, vote with their feet and you have the added benefit if these policies are failing and failing badly, you have other examples in nearby states uh, of economies being strong or robust versus the drag put on an economy by uh, you know, a Massachusetts type healthcare system or a Tennessee healthcare system. So I say all that to say, yes, can small entities uh, be evil? Can they make very bad mistakes? Sure. Anybody that's lived in a subdivision with a homeowners association knows uh, how nasty people can be. Uh, but you have it on a smaller scale. You have more control, more access to uh, the individuals in charge. It's a better system where you have a national one size fits all and you're essentially rolling the dice and constitutionalizing uh, or making policy uh, for all uh, X D million in the United States. Let's talk about some of the, the anti-federalists uh, since we kind of we got to them and we talked a little bit about what they were writing uh, or at least Im implied or like referred to what they were writing during the constitutional ratification debates. But who who were some of the anti-federalists? Uh, I mean, specifically, do, do we know who these people were? Now, that's a good question. There were a number of anti-federalists, a number wrote under pseudonyms, and we really don't know their identity. But in certain states, for example, um, uh, Melanchthon Smith in New York, or what folks call uh, the Smith Circle of his followers there, powerful anti-federalists with excellent arguments made during the New York Ratification Convention, as well as in newspapers and other places. Uh, in Virginia, you've got George Mason, you know, the drafter um, who wanted to draft uh, a Bill of Rights at the Constitutional Convention modeled on the Virginia Declaration of Rights, but was rejected in that task. You know, what a, a man of learning, uh, a man who believed in the people and small government. So you've got a number of well-known individuals like that, uh, Samuel Bryan, uh, for example, out of Pennsylvania, a strong anti-federalists. And then we have a number of people uh, who wrote uh, with pseudonyms, and we don't know who they are, like the old Whig. Some of the great anti-federalist letters are from the old Whig, for example. Uh, Richard Henry Lee uh, is believed to have written uh, some of the federal farmers' letters in Virginia. So these are men that you know go back to the revolution. They were fighting for an idea that they uh, thought the revolution secured this idea of self-government in the states and a lack of interference from a central power, whether it be Westminster or Philadelphia. Did they have? We think of the Federalists as having a, you know, a unified voice to some extent. Um, that they, you know, they all were advocates for adopting the Constitution, and so we can we can think of the Federalist Papers as this this body of somewhat unified arguments. Are the anti-federalists similar? Can we like read it as a as a corpus 
in that way or were they just a, more of a grab bag of people who were all opposed but maybe for different reasons or had different solutions in mind? No, the Federalists def definitely win the war with organization, uh, as we talked about earlier, even at the Constitutional Convention, because of the planning and organization, they had a leg up there. Uh, Madison, Hamilton, and of course, Jay had a small contribution to the Federalist Papers in New York. Uh, they were organized in how they wanted to present their arguments, uh, map them out, worked uh, long hours and gave a more coherent voice to what we know as the Federalist Papers, though we should not forget that there were many other Federalists in other states that were writing um, not so much um, as organized as Madison and Hamilton, but still uh, had a lot of output there where we can learn a lot from them. The Anti-Federalists didn't have that same organization that the Federalists did, though I will say uh, if you pick up the Anti-Federalist Papers, it is far from uh, just a collection of essays that really differ so much from each other that uh, you have trouble making sense out of them. You find uh, coherent arguments put forth. You find common themes um, dealing with certain clauses of the Constitution, how these are going too far, where the dangers are. And we see more importantly to me, rather than these men having no answer to what plagued uh, the Confederation or how to improve on the Constitution, we see a detailed program offered in the Anti-Federalist Papers and importantly uh, in the state ratification messages. Even as states ratify, uh, Anti-Federalists offer very comprehensive amendments uh, targeted at specific problems that they sought to fix that unfortunately Madison and the first Congress ignored. you have any favorite uh, arguments? Well, I guess what you think were the most prescient arguments offered amongst the anti-federalists in terms of their ability to correctly assess and predict what the constitution would become? I mean, I think some of the arguments, uh, we'll talk big picture arguments, would be the argument on consolidation, that essentially taking the view from Montesquieu that a republic needs to be small in size. I think one of the things plaguing us today is no matter how much we want to tinker with the Constitution, uh, how many changes we want to make, uh, the fundamental question is, are we really too big to be free? Now, no one seriously wants to divide the country up into various confederations uh, these days, but I think it's a fundamental question. Was Montesquieu correct or was Madison correct that if you extend the sphere, uh, you're going to cut down on faction and increase liberty and have this great population of whiz kid national legislators that uh, will be so much brighter than state officials. Well, considering our national debt is approaching uh, $20 trillion, considering all the problems we have uh, just balancing our books, uh, I don't think we have a great nation of whiz kid legislators up there. I don't think the problem of faction was addressed. Throughout our history, people, like-minded people in the United States have been able uh, to join um, craft policy programs, whether it be in the early republic, things dealing with slavery or even uh, the Alien and Sedition Acts early on or going forward. So one, I think the fundamental questions that they ask uh, are important. Representation. The Anti-Federalists uh, thought that representatives, as we mentioned briefly earlier, ought to you know, rub shoulders with their constituents, be amenable to them, ought to live under the laws they make in the community uh, where they still hold jobs. They shouldn't be just full-time professional politicians. What does our scheme of representation say about that today when we have one representative for essentially about you know, 700,000 people. Is that true representation? You know, George Washington was very concerned about uh, ratios of around you know, one 
representative for 30 or 40,000 people. Washington, a Federalist, was concerned that that was too much. What would uh, our first president say about the situation of representation today? So those are some fundamental uh, issues I think the anti-federalists got right. I think you look at uh, certain clauses that they pointed out, of course, uh, the general welfare clause, the commerce clause, necessary and proper clause. Uh, you know, they were right on on their predictions of how these uh, definite clauses would be abused and used to aggrandize national power. And possibly even beyond their wildest dreams, I would say. I think that some of the things you see with the government today might go further than even the most pessimistic anti-federalist. It might even go further than even the most uh, energetic federalist that, <laughs> they that, saw what's happening today. That's a, that's a good point, yeah. So you, even further than, say, Alexander Hamilton thought it could go. Um, so if we're going to try and fix some of these things, as you, as you say, uh, recovering the, the subtitle of your book, recovering the anti-federalist values of America's first constitution, if we're going to try and recover some of them and maybe through you know, public education and discussions like this, but if we have some actual fixes, maybe we could go back and think about what we could do to, to fix something. Do you have any specific suggestions? Sure. I think one thing, the overall amendment process is a problem. Congress, which has no motive to curtail national powers or its powers, is in control of the amendment process. It submits amendments to the states or it would call a constitutional convention if so petitioned by the requisite number. But still there's an argument that Congress would control the issues of a convention, etc. Uh, not getting into the runaway convention uh, issue, but just looking at the fact that Congress controls the amendment process. If we were, could just push for one amendment uh, somehow from the grassroots level, I would want to change the way that we amend our fundamental law. The states ought to be able to directly recommend amendments without these having to go through Congress. Uh, I think that would be a huge change. Uh, other amendments that we might could learn from the anti-federalists, for example, you know, we have this um, debt ceiling fight every now and then in the United States uh, as we continue to spend beyond our means. Um, when we had the demise of the requisition system, the anti-federalists feared we were lurching too far to give Congress a blank check, uh, or unlimited credit card, if you will. And for example, in the New York ratifying convention, they proposed that before the federal government would be able to borrow money, it would require a two-thirds vote in each house. Can you imagine the debt ceiling just willy-nilly being raised and raised and raised if uh, the Liberty Caucus and some other like-minded folks uh, could demand that two-thirds majority there? That would solve a good bit, I think, on our national debt and force Congress uh, to cut where cuts are needed there. Uh, I think another amendment would be to expand the House of Representatives if we do think we're not too big to be free, but there's something salvageable. The ratios that we have with our representatives compared to other uh, you know, republics and democracies are way out of whack. Japan, Germany, Great Britain all have more favorable ratios of representation than we do. You know, we've been stuck on 490 uh, since the early 1900s. Congress just said, Four, hey, you mean 435 is, or? Uh, excuse me, I'm, I was 435. We've been stuck on 435 since the early 1900s. And, uh, you know, Congress is by statute set it there when we should be augmenting the number of representatives. I understand the Senate is fixed, but uh, augmenting the number of representatives in the House uh, to take account of our growing population. So again, there could be 
uh, more of a vision of that anti-federal idea of representatives mixing uh, with the people being part of the people. We're a long way from what Washington uh, himself thought was proper, uh, but can we not do something such as augment the House uh, rotation in office? I know term limits were killed uh, by the Supreme Court uh, in the mid-1990s. But if we want to think of amendments and things that we could do, you know, rotation in office was a critical part of the Articles of Confederation. And I think the careerism that we have in Washington, though, again, the term limits movement has lost steam nationally. It continues to gain uh, in local and state offices. It's something that we should reconsider as well. But would that would those be those be moved toward freedom in the sense that I, I don't I don't particularly see increasing the size of the house uh, that that expresses the value of representation and democracy which is not necessarily the same as the value of, of substantive freedom uh, so, so if we need to have a I'm trying to think of what the action there there is a in the, the second original second amendment which means that Madison proposed 12 amendments that were ratified by the by the Congress. Uh, one of the amendments actually was a representation amendment. It said that uh, it should go up to one per 50,000 and it shall never go higher than one per 50,000, which would mean we'd have 7,000 or so members of the House, which would seem to be – So it's unbearable. A, a unbearable. Like, I mean it could be a fun reality show but maybe dysfunctional to the point of craziness. At that point, do, should we be having the conversation, which I think you've alluded to, uh, and also maybe like the, the big lesson here is that we're just too big? Now, I agree that the problem is that we are too big to be free. It's a fundamental issue. Uh, it goes to the original argument between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, again, going back to Montesquieu. Uh, until we can figure a way to tackle uh, that hard issue, we want to be a great empire, uh, not a, a confederal system with small republics. Until we change our mind there, I think, uh, say we're hopeless, but we're in bad shape. Thanks for listening. This episode of Free Thoughts was produced by Tess Terrible and Evan Banks. To learn more, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.